Hi brothers and sisters, Jerry O'Donnell here with Four Angels Messages. I put together this message called The Imagination of the Heart to warn people that every imagination that comes into our minds needs to be carefully guarded against and I thought I would be putting together a sermon or message that would just be dealing with that. You know, how do we guard against those imaginations, especially the ones that run wild, that are evil even? And then I found out in compiling all these verses together, it turns out to be very prophetic. Well, let's uh, unfold this after a word of prayer and see what I mean by that. Our Father, thank you so very much for this time to spend with you in thy word. We pray for thy Holy Spirit to be upon us. <clears throat> May we see it clearly. May it have the effect it's supposed to have upon us. May thy word transform us into the people that we ought to be for this hour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Like I said, I started out with a simple message <clears throat> to guard with the imaginations, and then you're going to see by the end of it how this actually fits into end time prophecy. So in my usual manner of asking questions and going to the Bible for the verses, we start off with the first question and that is, what relationship is there between our imaginations and God's knowledge? Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 31. So Deuteronomy 31 is our first text and we are going to search all the Bible on this subject nearly, if not exhausting, all of the scriptures that have any form of the word imagine, imagination, imaginations, things like that. So I did, like I said, I did do as close of an exhaustive lookup of all those things. I did not do the synonyms because then, well, maybe that'll be a part two and three, like mine, thought, but right now, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 31, and we're going to look here in verse 21. So Deuteronomy 31, 21, the Bible says, And it shall come to pass, when many evils and troubles are befallen them, that the song shall testify against them as a witness. For it shall not be forgotten uh, out of the mouths of their seed. For I know their imagination, which they go about even now, before I have brought them into the land, which I swear. Now, before I comment on that, let's go to Job 21. Job 21. And read another text. Job 21. And this time, verse 27. Job 21, 27, the Bible says here. Job 21, 27. Behold, I know your thoughts and the devices which you wrongfully imagine against me. So the relationship happens to be whatever enters into our minds, God already knows about those things. God is not surprised by our imagination. So we cannot imagine anything in our minds without God already knowing of those things. And so if we are planning and thinking that we could claim oops for doing some evil act, think again. God already knows our thoughts, our imaginations. So what are we counseled not to do then? Let's go to Zechariah. Chapter 7, Zechariah chapter 7, and let's get a couple of texts out of the book of Zechariah, so don't lose your place so quickly after we read the first one. Zechariah chapter 7, and let's read here in verse 10. The Bible says, and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of your imagine evil against his brother in your heart. And chapter 8, verse 17, the Bible says, And let none of your imagine evil 
in your hearts against his neighbor, and love no false oath, for all these are things that I hate, saith the Lord. So we need to be very careful of uh, uh, what we think about, especially when it comes to imaginations. And, he, and he, we also need to guard against the immediate reaction. You know, if a person cuts us off on a highway, or not a highway, but a intersection, that's what I meant to say, an intersection, what is our immediate reaction? But then many people have this process that kicks in that creates such an imagination. Uh, you know, they were going real fast and ran that stop sign and cut me off and nearly killed me. And how bad would they have feel, felt if they actually hit my vehicle, sent me to the hospital? I sue them. And, whoa, where are you going with all that? Give your mind a rest. So, we are counsel not to be thinking of, of these things. And, that, and uh, a word about psychiatry, uh, and psychiatrists and uh, people who try to lay out uh, behaviors of human beings. I once saw a, uh, a mini secular, I guess you could say, message. Uh, it was an interesting topic, how to deal with imaginations. And the conclusion of it is that this so-called doctorate degree person said, just run with your imagination, have it run to a conclusion, and then be done with it. Once it's out of the, uh, concluded, then it goes out of the mind and you'll not have to deal with it again. But this constant fighting against your imagination, it'll just keep coming at you and coming at you and coming at you until you just let it run its course. Because imaginations don't hurt anyone. Well, that is such wrong advice. First off, you just read what God said about that. We're not supposed to imagine evil. So therefore, taking it to extremes, of course, my own application, if I were to imagine towards uh, um, an attractive person a form of uh, adultery, and I just let it run to its conclusion, that would be okay with God? Absolutely not. It won't even be okay with my own spouse. We are not to let the imaginations just run wild and c go to its conclusion. When the thoughts come into the mind, we are to resist those imaginations. We are not to give it ground. Because remember, how a person thinks, so is that person. So therefore, even though the act did not physically happen, that person that lets the imagination run wild in the form of, let's say, adultery, is an adulterer in the eyes of God. Let us be very, very careful about that. And so we are to resist other things. Now, are there good imaginations? Let's go to First Chronicles. You know, uh, that's just it. A lot of people say, um, you know, well, then we shouldn't be letting our minds uh, uh, run on any subject with the imagination. And then the question would be, where does the creative mind uh, come in at then because God gave us a creative mind and creativity does happen in the imagination. So is all imagination, which I'm hinting at, uh, are there any good ones, let's say? And verse 9, so uh, uh, First Chronicles 28, that's where we're going, First Chronicles 28 and verse 9. First Chronicles 28, verse 9, the Bible says, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind, for the Lord searcheth all hearts and understand all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee, but if thou forsake him, 
he will cast thee off forever. So if we imagine in our minds our relationship with God, which is an impression or an image of God into our minds that is appropriate, biblical-based, um, all of those proper relationship, that would be a good imagination. Let's go to chapter 29, 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 18. The Bible says, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and the fathers, keep this forever in the imaginations of the thoughts of the heart of thy people, and prepare their heart unto thee. And so, uh, uh, recalling history of relationships with God that were appropriate with God, and replaying those things in our minds, because we don't always have the scriptures in our, our hands, that is actually a good thing. So, all of our senses has been given to us by God. All of our abilities have been given to us by God. It's, the, it's Satan who perverts them. He doesn't come up with anything new. So, therefore, the fact that imaginations exist, imaginations is not evil. It's what we use our imagination on that makes it evil. So there are good imaginations. But I would like to tell you that most of the scriptures that I have encountered with that word imagine or imaginations, they're pretty much on the wrong side, the evil side. In fact, if you take a look at the scriptures appropriately, you find out that there's a lot of rebuke in the scriptures because we are born in sin and it's to tell us, to instruct us, this is the wrong way. That's what you used to be. Now you need to become godly. And this is how you do it. That's the purpose of the scriptures. And so everybody that says, you know, every time I pick up the Bible, man, I feel so bad that uh, I'm not a good person. We are not naturally born good. That's the purpose. We should eventually get to the point where we can say, yeah, that's who I was, but I'm not that person anymore, just like Paul brings out. So, what are most imaginations? Uh, let's take a look at the book of Psalms, chapter 2 now. Psalms, chapter 2. In Psalms, chapter 2. And let's take a look here at verse 1. Psalm 2, and my pages, for whatever reason, are sticking together. There we go. Psalms 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? That's the first of three references. Let's go to Acts chapter 4 now. Acts chapter 4. And in Acts chapter 4, let's take a look here at verse 25. Acts chapter 4 and verse 25. The Bible says here, Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? And one more, Romans chapter 1. And let's look here at verses 21 to 22. The Bible says, because, Romans 1, 21, that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So, a lot of the imaginations are on vain thing. Huh. It's not necessarily so evil, but it shouldn't be done. What would happen if I got a million dollars? Well, how'd you get it? First off, oh, I played the lottery. Should you be playing the lottery now? But anyways, I got a million dollars. What would I do with that money? All the literature I could send out there. Yeah, but you would also be tempted to spend it a little selfishly, a little carelessly. Uh, 
when you were just making ends meet, we find ourselves to be a little more cautious in what we invest our money in. And uh, it's actually possibly good, better for our souls when we uh, don't sense the uh, tightness of the economy upon us. Uh, we, I, like I said, tend to l live a little more carelessly with, with the funds. Oh, $25 dinner, no problem. Let's eat out every night. Yeah, so that's what I, I'm, I'm getting at. So we need to uh, be very careful with what, where our imaginations go. A lot of it happens to be on vain things. Now, what are they considered in the eyes of God when we let our imaginations run like that? And, and like I said, it's not all, as they say, that bad. Well, the fact that it's bad is bad enough. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 6. For some reason, we have it in our minds that as long as things aren't that bad, God's going to let us into heaven. And that doesn't make sense at all. There's so many... Um, Errors to that one statement that I could spend an entire sermon on that alone uh, You know that's works oriented and all kinds of things. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 6 verses 16 and 19 It says these thing, these six things doth the Lord hate yea seven are an abomination unto him And I'm going to tell you that that's the answer right there an abomination, but we need the list of seeing uh, What that includes to see if our imaginations happen to be in the list and in verse 17, it says, A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Okay, not so far. Let's go to 18. A heart that devises wicked imaginations. There we go. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. Might as well finish it out. Verse 19 says, A false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. So when we allow our imaginations, especially that which is vain, especially that which runs to evil, as I gave an example before uh, with the adultery situation, that's an abomination to God. That is some serious evil that's going on. And again, nothing has to be acted out. Uh, we're even told that uh, we are responsible for that which we lacked in the opportunity to carry out. Uh, we're still it's regarded as being sinful. It's as if we did act it out. Just because we lack the opportunity uh, to do that, uh, man, I, I, I really don't like that person. I wish I could just, you know, uh, well, kill him. Well, do you have a gun? No, it's going to be difficult there. Do you have anything that you could kill him? No, I don't want to go to prison. But I really, you're guilty of murder. That's the bottom line especially when you're going all over the place like that. All right, so still in Proverbs, uh, what is in such people's hearts? Let's go to uh, Proverbs chapter 12. So you see that human beings really have a problem with their imaginations. Proverbs chapter 12, and let's look here in verse 20 to get the understanding of what is actually in people's hearts. 1220 the Bible says, deceit is in the heart of them uh, that imagine evil, but to the counselors of peace is joy. Our heart is, is very deceitful. And, uh, and those that have this imagination towards vain and evil things, um, it's just breeding more evilness. And so... Don't deceive your own heart by participating in any of those things. And again, taking up the lie, what harm is it? It's harming your own soul. Yes, that person gets to live because they're not really murdered. Yes, uh, uh, that person did not commit adultery, but you did in your own mind. So what are the results of evil imaginations? Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 7 now. Jeremiah chapter 7 and take a look here at 
Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 24. Jeremiah 7 verse 24. The Bible says, But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsel and in their imagination of their evil hearts, and went backward and not forward. Yeah, this one's a, a, a tough one that I'm trying to put into to words. Backwards is a type of backsliding. When we allow the imaginations to run wild, especially after we come to Christ and we say, okay, I used to live a life of hurting people. I used to live a life of picking up things that weren't mine called thievery. I used to uh, get around adultery. Uh, or fornication, whichever label you want to put on it, and all, all those other things. Um, and so now to deal with the thoughts that come into my mind, it's just going to be contained in my imaginations. But what that does is it causes backsliding in your relationship with God, and there is no forward progress into the light that we're supposed to be walking in. You see, our relationship with God is a forward motion. We are not to uh, uh, just say, I believe in Jesus and now I'm eternally saved. Uh, for us as a people, we say, oh, I believe in the fundamental beliefs, if that's what you want to believe, and that's good enough for me. It is a character relationship with God in which we are to grow in sanctification day after day after day until we are formed into the image that God would have us to be formed into. And so when we are allowing our imaginations to run wild and think upon anything we want, imagine on vain things, what if I was the greatest baseball player, or football player, or basketball player? Why are you wasting your energy of the mind thinking of those things? You shouldn't even be in competitive sports to begin with. But when we allow those things, there's no forward progress in the light of the Word of God. We can't understand the Scriptures as we ought to, especially in application. You see, when you search the scriptures and even read the scriptures, it is a sanctifying process. And those that get nothing more out of the Bible means that there's something wrong with, in this case, the imagination. Because we should have aha moments often and should never stop. I don't care how many times we read certain verses. In fact, I had an aha moment in putting this together. Like I said, I just thought this was a certain, uh, a simple message about guarding the thoughts, which so far it is. But then the second half is going to turn out to be very prophetic using the imagination verses alone. So let's not allow backsliding in our spiritual life because we are spending our energy with vain imaginations and even potentially evil imaginations, thinking everything's okay because we're not really carrying those things out. You're training up the mind, basically, in the wrong pathway. So, who's an example of what imaginations drive people to do? Let's go to, in Jeremiah chapter 9 now, and verse 14. Chapter 9 and verse 14. The Bible says here, but have walked after the imagination of their own heart and after Balaam, which their fathers taught them. You know the story of Balaam. He's offered a nice payment if he would just curse, uh, well, cause Israel to uh, succ uh, succumb to being taken over. And uh, initially, it is said that, you know, n there's no way, as long as they have a, a relationship with God, there is no way you're going to be able to 
take over these people because God's going to continue to protect them. Uh, and so, no thanks. You can't give me enough money uh, to try and get these people to succumb to, to your ways. But then, while he is thinking, using his imagination, it really would be nice to have all that wealth, it eventually gets the best of him that he talks to an animal, not so fearful of an angel that uh, is about to slay him, and then attempts to curse Israel and cannot, and then comes up with a plan that actually does take down Israel, and hence, for the wealth, he traded his soul. He sold his, his soul, basically. And so Balaam is the answer to that question. What can imaginations lead to? Uh, back on the, the murdering thing. If that person continues to irritate us, people just keep thinking evil of somebody, eventually do murder. Uh, especially in adultery. That seems to, you know, people will eventually act upon those things. And so we need to be very careful about that. What do many imagine to do? Let's go to Psalms 21 now. So what do people imagine to do? Psalm chapter 21. And let's take a look here in verse 11. Psalm 21, verse 11. For they intended evil against thee, they imagined a mischievous device which they are not able to perform. So, just as we are counseled, because we lack the uh, opportunity, doesn't mean we're off the hook. God just called us out on that when we allow our imaginations into mischievous devices. But the, the fact that we can't carry them out to perform it, that is condemned of God. Let's go to Psalms 38 now. Psalm 38 and verse 12. Psalm 38 and verse 12. They also that seek after my life lay snares for me, and they seek my hurt, speak mischievous things, and imagine deceits all the day long. Some people allow their imaginations to really run wild from the morning they get up to the time they go back to bed. All day long, uh, they imagine these things. Let's go to Psalm 62. And what do they imagine? Mischievous things. Psalms 62 now is where we're headed. See, the Bible has a lot to say about imagination. In verse 3, Psalm 62, 3, How long will ye imagine mischievous, um, mischief against a man? Ye shall be slain, all of you, as the a bowing wall shall ye be, and as a tottering fence. Uh, fence tottering, can't hold things, and walls aren't safe, that's bowing. Uh, it's a sign that they're about to fall apart. They need to be reinforced. And so what we see here is that to be slain, that's going to be the final destination. If we allow our imaginations to go unchecked because we think that it doesn't hurt anyone, and uh, be it allowing it to run wild for a matter of five seconds, five minutes, five hours. In the end, God holds us accountable for our imaginations and we will be slain in the end. So what curse is placed upon those that imagine mischievous things? Let's go to Psalms chapter 10 now. Psalm 10. And let's take a Look here at verse 2. Psalm, Psalm chapter 10, verse 2, the Bible says, The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in their devices that they have imagined. So the curse is that, uh, you know, uh, that person deserves to die. 
they themselves could end up dying. Whatever evil that they're thinking of, uh, how do I get a hold of a million dollars when someone robs their house? That's the curse that's placed on, upon them. What did Jesus compare the end of the world or the end of time with? Let's go to Matthew chapter 24 now. So we're kind of making our transition, if you would, into the prophetic. Matthew chapter 24, and let's take a look here at verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And as part of the description, let's go to Genesis chapter 6. So let's go to Noah and see how those days happen to be. It's famously quoted, especially uh, in prophecy seminars. Um, Genesis chapter 6, where they tried to bring up, you know, this is how the days of Noah were. And I'm going to use that exact same reference. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. The Bible says here, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's what life was like in the days of Noah, and is being repeated in our day and age, especially out of Hollywood. Uh, whatever imaginations they have out of Hollywood, it hits the film, and... Look where we are. P people say that uh, that movies have no effect upon them. Look how a degraded society we live in today. And if anybody uh, says that, uh, no, no, every generation, it, it, they always point to these evil things. Or so, so. No, folks. W people blatantly sin today and get away with it. Those that stand for righteousness are the ones that get in trouble and even face jail time. We are definitely in a generation where good is evil and evil is good. So, when do our imaginations uh, go? To, uh, when do our imaginations go towards evil? Let's go to Genesis chapter eight. Genesis chapter 8, there's a purpose to this one in verse 21. So, Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, the Bible says, Else if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, whoops, that's Exodus. That's not going to help us very much. Genesis chapter 8, and verse 21, and the Lord And the Lord smelled a uh, sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not uh, again curse the ground any more for a man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living uh, that I have done. And so what, what we have here is that people think uh, that he's not going to keep to his word. And uh, from our youth up, we think of, of these things. This is what causes people to, well, leave the church in, church in their youth and go and seek the uh, recognition, not obtain it, and then come to the end of their life uh, all beaten up. And then come to the Lord, possibly. Possibly. Not always. Um, so, our imaginations from our youth, as that's said there, uh, yeah, is evil from his youth. That's a lot of energy used, and it's a shame that it's wasted. Uh, when we start figuring out what life really is about, we're usually much older. We have learned from experience what is, what at the time we thought no big deal was a big deal. And now as we have matured, we realize that we lost a whole lot of energy, wasted it that is, when we could have served the Lord better than what we had. The good news is that we still can serve the Lord and have learned from those lessons. 
So what does the imagination in the heart then lead to? Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29. And take a look here in verse 19. Deuteronomy chapter 29. Deuteronomy 29. And take a look here at verse 19. The Bible says, And it came to pass when he heareth the words of this curse that he blessed himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of my own heart, to add drunkenness to thirst. Many people become drunk on the ways of the world, not realizing that one sip of the world leads to the next sip, which leads to the next sip, and before you know, you're well entrenched in the ways of the world that you cannot see yourself out of the world anymore. That it's... It's so acceptable with society. In fact, society, the ways of the world, have put their seal of approval on acceptance, that is, to many things that the Bible condemns and even calls an abomination. But yet we, without a strong relationship with God, can't see those things. And when we are exposed to the ways of the Bible. Oh, you're misinterpreting the scriptures. God doesn't hate, really. He hates evil, of course. Now, <clears throat> with that in mind, as the society has put their seal of approval on, what is very concerning about these imaginations? Let's go to Genesis chapter 11, especially when we talk about the acceptance of society. Genesis chapter 11, In Genesis 11, let's take a look here. Genesis 11, verse 6. The Bible says, And the Lord said, Behold, the people are, is one, and they have all one language, and th this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. When the people are unified, when they are one, there is nothing holding them back. We got to see that with uh, the release of the challenges we had a few years ago, let's say, uh, back in 2020. Uh, worldwide, things are shut down. Uh, whatever they wanted to implement, they did so because people were in fear. And so all the governments of the world were unified and in, enacted strange laws, strange rules, rules that didn't make any sense. I mean, anybody with half a mind knows that sunshine and air helps heal people. And yet we're told that we are not to be able to go out, outside that is. Did not make sense whatsoever. And that's just a, one example. And another example happens to be the number of times that uh, you had to go get shot up um, and in such a short period of time. It just did not make sense. There was definitely an agenda afoot, if you would. Now. What shall this unification lead to? Let's go to Psalms 140. Psalm 140. And like I said, we are clearly then, if you're thinking that way, in the prophetic aspect of this message. Psalms 140. And let's take a look here in Psalms uh, 140. And verse 2, the Bible says, Which imagine mischief in their hearts continually are they gathered together for war? Gathered together for war. Hey, isn't there a, a scripture uh, out of uh, um, 
yeah, out of revelation about gathering the people of the nations for war, called Armageddon. And that is exactly what I'm turning in the, this message into. When the imaginations are unified, it is building the ultimate war, not World War III, but rather against God. And everything that happens to be of God, you are seeing today, is being squashed, condemned, ruled against, lawed against. You can accept any other religion but that of Christianity. And that's where we have moved to. In fact, let's go to Revelation chapter 12 to solidify this. Revelation chapter 12. And take a look here at verse 17. The Bible says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. There's an all-out war against keeping the Ten Commandments, so much so that even the woman, the church, is involved with that. Oh, you guys are too legalistic that you keep those, those Ten Commandments. Don't you know they've been nailed to the cross anyways? It's an all-out all war that the world has been prepared to participate in and are continuing to be prepared for it. So what issue will arise and the reason for it. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 11 now. Jeremiah chapter 11. And let's take a look here in verse 8. The Bible says, Yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked every one in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore I will bring upon them all the words of the coven this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. The imaginations are leading to a unification not to do the commandments, working against hearing the word of God, wanting to do their evil, and and not feel the guilt of it, hence why they have to legislate certain things. Don't be reminding me that I'm doing an abomination. Uh, you're a mean person. We're going to make sure you never get to say that again, and if you preach a sermon on that, we'll lock you up. Uh, there are such rules, by the way. Not universal, but we're headed that way. Um, so, People basically, in the unification of their imaginations of doing evil continuously, they don't want to hear the Word of God. Uh, they don't want to hear the Ten Commandments. They outright reject the commandments. And what else do they refuse to do? Let's stay in Jeremiah for a little bit. Go to chapter 16 now and take a look here at verse 12. You see, there's nothing new under the sun, God says. So what we see happening leading up to the days of Babylon is being repeated in our day. Jeremiah 16, verse 12, the Bible says here, And ye have done worse than your fathers, for behold, ye walk every one after the imagination of his evil heart, that they may not hearken unto me. Uh, previous generations tossed out God from the schools. The Bible being outlawed. Uh, yeah, it's kind of making its way back in, but it's nothing like it used to, to be. And so our generation is worse than the prior generations because a godless society, no exposure to God whatsoever, raises, allows people to stay in their sins run rapid with their imaginations, continuously <coughs> uh, being evil. And that is, like I said, right where we happen to, to be at. Uh, it is just an outright war against God himself. What will they choose to follow instead? Let's go to chapter 18 now. Jeremiah chapter 18, this time to verse 12. Uh, Jeremiah 18 12 and they said there is no hope but we will walk after our own devices and we will uh, every one to do the imagination of his evil heart and so that is what's happening is that 
they, they don't believe there's any hope in, in the world and they need the governments basically want you to follow what they dictate is the short of it what specifically will be involved go to chapter 13 Jeremiah chapter 13 and let's see here in verse 10 Jeremiah chapter 13 verse 10 this evil people which refuse to hear my words which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after their other gods to serve them and to worship them shall even be as this girl which is good for nothing so the good for nothing people but basically it's going to lead to the worship of other gods and we're already there again uh, I make reference to the last few Super Bowl halftime shows. It's outright paganism. All the celebrities that are singing all kinds of garbage songs to begin with, it is such a pagan worship fest that Christians that are so caught up into it, uh, it used to be that, oh, how dumb the people of Israel were to worship the golden calf, to worship the golden uh, uh, or these statues from other nations and go after their gods and leave the true God. Uh, how dumb could they be? It's happening again. All the Christians out flock to certain celebrities to hear their music as they roll out uh, different golden creatures uh, <coughs> and they're basically all doing it given the devil signs dressing uh, devilish even and let's go to Revelation 13 Revelation chapter 13 and what this leads to is in verse 16 Revelation 13 16 the Bible says, and he causes all, both small and great, and rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their hand and on their foreheads. And so that's what this is all leading to. So paganism is very rapid, rampant, that is, uh, throughout society and is acceptable even. Down with Christianity, up with paganism. Children are even being sacrificed to this stuff. Uh, what lies shall be taught then about this so that they get away with this? Jeremiah chapter 23. Back to Jeremiah. You didn't think Jeremiah would be that prophetic of end time events, but uh, after all of this, I think you might be taking a different look at Jeremiah. So let's go to Jeremiah chapter 23. And let's look here at verse 17. Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 17. The Bible says here, They shall still un I'm sorry, they say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, Ye shall have peace. And they say unto every one that walketh after that imagination of his own heart, No evil shall come upon you. What did Jeremiah just say? Let me take you to an easier text that will help explain this. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And take a look here at verse 3 as well. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. They are saying unto themselves that trust us, we are leading you into a society of peace. We're welcoming in peace. We're all going to get along together. We're going to legislate it so that we all walk in unison and there'll be no more evil whatsoever and then sudden destruction shall come. So, what shall our cry be instead? Let's go to Lamentations. Also written, uh, you'll find that right after Jeremiah, by the way. Um, 
Lamentations is where we're going. And take a look here. That's because it, this is the weeping prophet, as they say. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 60. And we'll read onwards to 66. Lamentations chapter 3, starting in verse 60. Thou hast seen all their vengeance and all their imaginations against me. It's going to be against us eventually. Those that stand for the commandments of God and have the faith and testimony of Jesus Christ, that's what's going to happen. Verse 61, Thou hast heard their reproach, O Lord, and all their imaginations against me, us. The lips of those that rose up against, well, it says me, but it's us, and their devices against me all the day. Done changing the word, you understand what's going on. This is uh, prophetically speaking towards uh, the war that will be on Seventh-day Adventists. Behold, they're sitting down and they're rising up. I am their music. Render unto them a recompense, O Lord. Record to the, uh, according to the work of their hands. Give them sorrow of heart, thy curse unto them. Persecute and destroy them in anger from under the heavens of the Lord. Okay, we're not going to be that direct with, with things, but basically we are going to be a warning people. You guys are persecuting us for doing what? Living according to the Ten Commandments? That's it? We don't want to keep your Sabbath? And now you're going to devise all these things to force us to actually break the Sabbath and keep the pagan day of the sun worship Sunday and and consider that a day of rest instead and all these things. Don't you know that you're going to enter into the seven last plagues with the mark of the beast? And that's basically what Jeremiah just described here. Of course, he didn't know about the mark, mark of the beast, so he said it in that way. Of course, he was speaking... Um, what was going on at that time, his people are going to be taken off into literal Babylon. So that's the wording that he gave here. But remember, all these writers, so remember, <clears throat> all the writers wrote for more of our time than their own time. Sure, they uh, wrote in their own language. Uh, of the experience that they were experiencing. Hence why Jeremiah kept saying, me, 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 and I kept changing it to us, 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 because that's what he was experiencing. But the fact that they wrote more for our time, we need to change the word us into Seventh-day Adventists. We need to change the, all the things that th those wicked devices upon the laws that they are enacting today. <clears throat> and the squeezing that they have to enforce those things. Uh, oh, you don't have to participate, but if you don't participate, you don't get such and such. In other words, you don't get to keep your job. You don't get to uh, go to the grocery store. You don't get, you get the point. Eventually, uh, it does lead to some serious, serious restrictions. Um, take a look here, uh, let's see here, uh, in Revelation, uh, chapter 13, <clears throat> Revelation 13 and verse 16, eventually it leads to <clears throat> this type of relationship. <clears throat> Uh, the Bible says, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in his right hand or in uh, their forehead. And of course, without that, they cannot buy or sell. Um, <clears throat> yeah. When we... We also have to take Jeremiah's uh, message that he was giving just a moment ago and see it in, well, the light of the whole Bible now. Now we have the whole Bible. And uh, Jeremiah, you know, 
uh, calling down persecution upon them and that they would be taking their own devices. Go to Revelation chapter 15 now. <clears throat> And let's take a look here at verse 1. It says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up with the wrath of God. So we're not going to deliver a message that says, condemn them, burn them, get, destroy them. But rather, we're going to see the message more of, listen, all these things that are happening in the world, this is our cry, uh, all these things that are being enacted, all of this is the mark of the beast. And if you accept the mark of the beast, it's going to lead to the seven last plagues. I don't want to see you involved with the seven last plagues. I don't want you to be taken into your device because if you keep to this, you get the seven last plagues. In fact, you get to be on the losing side. Revelation chapter 19, for instance, starting in verse 11, and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and <clears throat> he had a name written that no man knew but himself and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of god <coughs> sorry excuse me <clears throat> Evidently, he didn't drink enough water. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. That's some serious being on the wrong side, if you would ask me. So what is the result of this war? Let's go back to Jeremiah. Again, as I said, you don't think of Jeremiah as a prophetic book, as far as uh, direct application to us, but we might want to rethink that. You know, Daniel, most definitely. Revelation, most definitely. Uh, lots of Isaiah, again, most definitely. But we're going to Jeremiah chapter 3 and see that we should take a different look. Where there's literal Babylon, it's spiritual Babylon. Where there's literal Israel, uh, there is spiritual Israel. And here in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 17, the Bible says, And at the time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more <clears throat> after the imagination of their evil heart. So the imaginations are going to come to an end. When is this? When all the nations surround Jerusalem and are gathered to Jerusalem. Uh, has that ever happened? No, it has not. Is that future then? That's the only option left. Otherwise, the scriptures would be in error. Let's go to chapter. Uh, let's go to Luke chapter one now. Luke chapter one, and work our way up to the prophetic fulfillment thereof. Luke chapter one, verse fifty-one. Luke one, fifty-one. The Bible says here. He hath showed strength with the arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their heart. So everybody's been scattered according to the imaginations of their heart, being God. And now there's going to be a gathering. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20 and see this gathering happening. <coughs> Verse 9. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death, uh, that's not verse 9. I'm sorry. Revelation 20, verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The gathering right before hellfire is the gathering of all nations around Jerusalem. Are we 
actually sure about that? Let's go to chapter 21, and let's look here at verses 2 to 5. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So there you go. Verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God, and God shall wipe away their tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. So that's what it is, is that the new city, Jerusalem, comes down. Uh, the thousand years are over. Satan is loosed from his prison. All the nations are gathered to attack the city. And then they're stopped in their tracks. And that is when they're going to acknowledge who is the true ruler. They will have no choice. All will be unmasked. Now, what is the promise after this? Let's go to Nahum. <coughs> the book of Nahum. Let's go there. Nahum. Nahum is where we're headed. And <clears throat> in the book of Nahum, we're going to go to chapter 1. Nahum, chapter 1. Almost there. Nahum, chapter 1, let's read here in verses 9 through 11. The Bible says, What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end of affliction, or um, an utter end. Affliction shall not r rise up a second time. That's what we're told in Jeremiah. The imaginations are going to cease. For while they are be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble, fully dry. That's how fire. There is one <coughs> come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a, a wicked counselor. And uh, that is the final being to be uh, removed. It's and burned completely. And that's none other than Satan. <clears throat> so, what are we to do today? Let's go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. And take a look here at chapter 10. 2 Corinthians. Chapter 10. Some good counsel here. And take a look here at verses 3 to 6. The Bible says... <clears throat> For though we uh, walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. The pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That is our duty right now. Every imagination that comes in, bring it into captivity according to the will of God. Don't let it run rampant and do whatever it wants to do. And wherever evil happens to be, especially working against God, whatever effort we can put forth there to share the truth, let us do it. He's not calling us to march and destroy physically anything but to continuously share the truth. Get the pamphlets out there. Um, pass along whatever you can pass along. Tell people wh whatever form is impressed upon you to get the message out. Souls are dying for eternity. Do we love souls or not? Everybody that's timid, 
You got to put away that timidity. Jesus gave his entire life to save us. What is so challenging uh, that we are so timid uh, about it that we are in such fear that we don't want to share the gospel? And for those that say, I, I don't want to say the wrong thing. Saying nothing lets them die in their sin. You've already condemned them. Say something. So, that's our responsibility. But personally, we need to bring into captivity every imagination to the thoughts that God approves of. We cannot let it just run its course. Despite what these leading psychiatrists tell us to do, and I'll never get that time back that I, I wasted. I'm so glad it was a, a, a nine-minute video that I, I watched. Very rarely do I take in some type of secular thing, but the title, uh, as one uh, Seventh-day Adventist sermon ends, uh, they, YouTube has a habit of suggesting a whole bunch of things, and it caught my eye, and I thought it was an interesting subject, only to find out that, what should I expect from the world? A worldly solution. Without God, there is no victory. Only through Jesus Christ is there victory, and he can give us victory over every imagination. Every imagination. So hold on to Jesus. Stay connected with him. Use the word of God in your life on a daily basis, and share it with others. Please, let's pray. Our Father, thank you so very much for this time to have spent with thee. I pray that you will send us forth thinking on these things, receiving the strength we need to bring every imagination to captivity, not let the imaginations run wild in our own lives, and where we can meet the imaginations with thy word and uh, help plant seeds into others to have them think about surrendering their imaginations as well. May you use us as instruments. Give us the words to speak, the courage to face even the most challenging situations. And may we trust in thee always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.